Why am I food out? That class just about ran me ragged today. Questions, 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 till I thought they'd never stop. Well, but that sounds good to me. Oh, well, it is good. You know, I appreciate it. It's just that, well, there's so much to cover that I get a little upset when we can't stick to the schedule. Well, now, what slowed you up today? Well, it's kind of funny in a way. Young Bob Hancock got to going on his theory that uh, the movies hadn't contributed much to American life. Oh, you don't need to tell me what's coming next. <laughs> he couldn't have picked anyone better to say that to. Well, the funny part of it was, you see, <clears throat> so many of my other students know about this theory of mine, about the arts of the country reflecting the uh, life and the times, you know. I guess they knew what was coming to. <laughs> well, did it turn into a free-for-all? Well, not quite. Uh, you see, after I'd uh, pointed out some of the contributions the movies had made, why the discussion drifted on to the other arts. Oh, eventually everybody got in on it, and I think it was a good session. The kids <laughs> enjoyed it. But, uh, well, it kind of disturbs me when we can't uh, stay on the schedule. Well, uh, I suppose you were thinking about the war or something. Is that what your lecture was about? Yes. Oh, yes. The uh, period before the First World War. Uh, well, of course, I have personal memories of that, and your students don't, so... Well, that's true, of course. But they must understand why we fought that war and why we fought the Second World War. So that perhaps we can profit by our mistakes and not have to fight a third one. You remember what President Wilson said when he came back from the peace conference after the war? Well, now, to what in particular are you referring? He said that peace cannot endure for a generation unless guaranteed by the unified forces of the civilized world. Well, that's quite prophetic, I'd say. Yes. Yes, it was. I wonder if we'll ever learn. Well, I must be getting on and get my notes rearranged here and see if we can get that schedule back on. And I have some work to do upstairs. <laughs> well, she warned me that if I, if I didn't put stuff away down here in my den, she wouldn't do it for me. <laughs> you know, I can't quite get that world war discussion we had in class out of my mind. I suppose it's because, as Esther says, we have personal memories of those things. I was just a youngster then, of course. Uh, oh, muscular, good-looking youth, no doubt. But, uh, and like all the rest of the country, I wanted to get in there and, and fight to save the world. The first drafting of men started in June of 1917. And all over the town, posters were packed up enticing young men to join the service. Long lines uh, started forming at the recruiting offices. And the parades of servicemen going off to war became a common thing. Well, sir, you know what they did to me? They made me a cook. <laughs> but cook or not, I was in. Well, you know, Esther and I were dating just before I left for France. She used to keep me pretty well informed of what was going on back here. 
The thing she used to write most about was the food conservation program. Hooverism, it was called, because Herbert Hoover, later to become president, headed it up. And Americans responded well to the plea not to waste food. One magazine gaily cautioned mothers, do not permit your child to take a bite or two out of an apple and throw the rest away. Nowadays, even children must be taught to be patriotic to the core. <laughs> Let's just let that rest right there. <laughs> oh, say, here's something that Esther doesn't know I still have. I don't think she does. Keep down here in the drawer. Some letters she wrote to me while I was in France. Now, they were talking about this in, in one of her letters here, if I can find... Yes, in this one. We're doing our part here at home, and I must confess, I am doing things I never thought I would do. The city women have a garden club. We have quite learned how to save on vegetables now. And admittedly, our cupboards don't have anything that will be wasted. By now, we are thoroughly convinced that the posters are telling us to do the right thing. turned out to welcome those of us to return. And nothing was too good for the boys. Over at the Hippodrome Theater, Special shows were being presented for those who were wounded. Well, after we were home, we faced the prospect of readjusting to civilian life. Our country was making a readjustment, too. All around, a person could detect the signs of change after 1918. The first change had come earlier, when we had switched from an isolationist country to a world power fighting in a world war. So President Wilson had little reason to doubt that we would follow through, fight the war, then join with other countries to help preserve the peace. In fact, I've got a clipping in my case here. A headline I was going to show my class if we never got through that 1918 period. Yes. The ultimate outcome will be triumphant acceptance of treaty and leave. I do not doubt the issue. Wilson. But President Wilson's dreams, the dreams of the world as it later turned out, were destined to failure. 
He attended the peace conference and became beloved by all Europe because of his true idealism and humanitarianism. But the plans of Lloyd George of England, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson dissolved into nothingness when America rejected the League of Nations. There was a strong bloc in Congress working against our joining the League. Senators Lodge, Bora, and Johnson led it. The American people didn't want to sign a long-term lease to protect other countries in case of war. They wanted to take no chances on becoming involved in another European war. They were concerned with getting back to normal, to their play, to their work. Well, at this time, there was a man in America who was living with the working class and writing about the working class. This man was Carl Sandburg. Sandburg dramatized the moral strength and dignity of the common man. He was one of the new group of poets who were using American scenes for their content and developing a whole new style. Oh, there was Robert Frost, and Edgar Lee Masters, Edward Arlington Robinson, and Carl Sandburg. Sandburg's father, you see, was a Swedish immigrant, and young Sandburg knew firsthand how death and despair were fought off by America's foreign-born. Many of his early poems were about the immigrant worker and his beloved Chicago. Just let me read you the first part of his poem, Chicago. Hog Butcher of the World tool maker, sacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shores. Don't you just feel the life and the vitality in that? Well, when his book Chicago Poems came out, it hit the genteel readers the same way the butcher's mall hits the steers. The result was a completely new American book and a new voice. It wasn't long until to thousands of Americans, the new poetry meant Carl Sandburg. Oh, he'd driven a milk wagon and worked in barber shops and in the lunch counter and on the railroad and in wheat fields. Sandburg wrote during the war, too. His poetry speaks for itself. This is called Buttons. I have been watching the war map, slammed up for advertising in front of the newspaper office. Buttons, red and yellow buttons, blue and black buttons are shoved back and forth across the map. And a laughing young man, sunny with freckles, climbs a ladder, yells a joke to somebody in the crowd, and then fixes a yellow button one inch wet, and follows the yellow button with a black button one inch wet. 10,000 men and boys twist on their bodies in a red soak along a river edge, gasping a wound, calling for water, some rattling death in their throat. Who would guess what it cost to move two buttons one inch on the war map here in front of the newspaper office where the freckle-faced young man is laughing at us? Well, there you have it. The war being fought, the war coming to an end, Carl Sandburg talking to America about America, and with the war over, people settling down to a peacetime normal existence. Well, the federal government was putting up a few housing projects to help the veteran along, and the nation was developing a taste for small, compact bubbles although the desire was still strong for Georgian homes and homes patterned after the European style. And several new architects began to take the spotlight. Frank Lloyd Wright was still ahead of his time. And Purcell and Elmsley, a firm which grew out of the original Sullivan group, was among the leaders. You remember my mentioning that Lewis Sullivan was the father of the skyscraper.
The banks built in the Midwest proved to be far ahead in design. Here's a bank in Grinnell, Iowa, designed by Sullivan. And this is the courthouse at Sioux City, Iowa, done in 1917 by Purcell and Elmsley. And it's still an imposing building. Well, how now, Lady Macbeth? What have we here? The sleepwalking scene? Howard, now you know very well we took this lamp upstairs last night during the storm. Did you finish your schedule yet? No, not quite. I'm just through that post-war period, the time of transition. Oh, well, it certainly was a period of transition in our national political thought. So what about your favorite subject, the arts? You know, Howard, uh, you haven't convinced me that uh, well, the movies, for instance, were reflecting the time. The movies? Why, my dear, the movies were going through the most terrific period of transition in the history of the industry. They were changing just like the rest of the country's thought was. You convinced me. Oh, now, you're too easily persuaded. Oh, you think so? Well, why don't you put me to the test? All right, I will. I've got just what it takes to prove it to you. Now, you're not going to get out that merry riddle hat again. No, oh, no, no walking <laughs> this evening, please. <laughs> well, ooh, haven't had these films out for quite a while, obviously. Well, what are they? Well, I have several films here. You see, when Europe went to war in 1914, America was turning out the, over half of the total movie production of the world. Uh-oh, I feel a lecture coming on. Well, relax and enjoy it. Y you mean I have no choice? Apparently not. Well, then I might as well make myself comfortable. Now, now what were you saying? I was saying that the movie industry had reached a turning point in its development in 1914. This was the time when the feature-length movies were capturing the public's taste. Well, now, what did that mean? No more Nickelodeon? They were rapidly fading out of the picture, and the bigger movie houses took over. Why, by 1916, uh, only the, the smallest theaters had pianists. Oh, well, that, that was the year of the full orchestra then. Yes, they were adding a little classical music to the atmosphere. <laughs> Well, how did the people who were used to pianos and Nickelodeons react to that? Seems as though it might have gone over their heads. Well, as a matter of fact, this time the audiences themselves were becoming more sophisticated, you know. Well, everybody attended from all walks of life, just like they do now. Well, it's understandable, especially if Griffiths was making uh, movies like that, uh, Judith of Bethulia Bible story you showed me. Oh, well, Judith of Bethulia was just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Why, Griffith produced some of the uh, two of the most famous movies of his career during this period. Oh, which ones were they? Birth of a Nation and In Parliament. And they far surpassed anything that had been produced in this period just before the World War. They really showed Griffith's artistic sense. Mm -hmm. Well, but he did make other films, though, didn't he? Oh, yes, of course. Of course. But uh, this, uh, this Birth of a Nation film, it, it was really epoch-making as far as movies were concerned. You see, Griffith just stripped away all convention and uh, dramatized the the dramatic possibilities of film. But of course, when the war came along, that's something else again. And Griffith and the other producers began making films that dealt with the, oh, the feeling of the day. Mm -hmm. Well, the movies then really had a part in the fight. Oh, yes, you bet they did. But even before the war, they were commenting on our uh, changing attitudes. Oh, you mean from being peace-minded to preparing for war. Right. Mm -hmm. But now, all the movies weren't of that caliber, though, were they? Uh, isn't this the time Charlie Chaplin got started? Yes, yes, Charlie Chaplin. He started with Max Sennett. Oh, yes. He's the man who was responsible for the Keystone Cop. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could say anyone was responsible for them, yes. But to say, I think I have a, a film of Max Sennett's here with Charlie oh. Chaplin in it. Yes. Called The Rounders. Senate was the king of parodies and burlesque, a man who made fantastic movies full of gags and tricks. One of his early players was Charlie Chaplin. Chaplin, in the Senate films, just used his talents according to what Senate wanted. 
Later, he was to become an individual. The man with the mustache, the cane, and the derby became a star and a producer in his own right. Charlie Chaplin, master of pantomime, comedian, commentator, satirist, social critic. Every man seemed to recognize in Chaplin's experiences his own dreams and disappointments. Chaplin's frustrations are mankind. In his movie, The Kid, two social outcasts try to get along. The Kid is Jackie Coogan. We hit an extreme when Theda Bayer became famous as the fan. Irresistible and heartless, skillfully setting her trap for a man. But another battle was going on, a battle in the form of war. The movie industry rallied to sell the war to America. D.W. Griffith produced a movie, Hearts of the World, showing how German militarism was a threat to wor world civilization. For this, he received a war service honor. Battle scenes were often filmed in parks, and others were filmed abroad. Where the movies had previously preached against the war, they now preached preparedness and battling for one's country. So the movies had become a propaganda tool during World War I. And soon, uh, political and military films would be ready for public choice. Good heavens, Howard, how you do go on. I ask about Chaplin, and I get Senna, Cedar Bear, Griffith, and half of the World War. <laughs> well, they were all very important, my dear. Of course they were. But you know, you left out one important person, Douglas Fairbanks. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> Don't tell me you were a fan of his. Oh, you're making me blush, but... I do remember some of the things that happened in his play. Well, then suppose you give me the lecture. Well, all right. Relax and enjoy it. Now, let's see. First, I remember how energetic he was in all the parts he played. Yes, he was the ideal of American upright youth. And then I remember how he made the slang a part of our language. Mm -hmm. Gee whiz was one of his expressions. And uh, then I uh, remember... I um, uh, can't seem to think of any more myself right now. <laughs> oh, and how could you forget this one? He was the perfect male to millions of American women. I didn't forget, believe me. I was just being polite. Oh. Oh, oh well. <coughs> All right, my dear, then you win this prize for the day. A picture of his called the Americano. And it shows it's typical of how he was just uh, uh, blind to fear. He faltered not regardless of the odds.
see all of that one of these days. Oh, I'll be glad to run it off for you. It really shows how the movies were becoming an art form, you know, more sophisticated. Esther! Esther! Sounds like Jimmy. Wonder what he wants this time. Oh, we're down here, dear. Well, that is something, isn't it? I'm digging, but I don't see anything particularly <laughs> crazy about it. Well, those aren't buttons you're looking at. Oh, now, oh. Jimmy, I think that Uncle Howard knows they're dusty. Yes. I'm living. Hmm, how's tricks? <laughs> hey, that's pretty terrific, isn't it? <laughs> Say, have you ever seen my collection? Uncle Howard, don't tell me you have a collection. A hat, too. Well, not a hat, but it's a collection, my boy. A collection. <coughs> Just look at some of those. I am saving food. I don't get it. Why, that's the World War I button that admonished people not to waste food. And I'm afraid, Jimmy, that it's just a little bit before your time. Listen, dear, why don't you come and go upstairs with me? Your uncle has to figure out how he can catch up on his lecturing. Well, what I really came over for was to borrow a wrench. I've got to fix my bicycle seat. What's the matter with it? Oh, it keeps falling over. Oh, well, stick around a while. I'll go up and help you fix it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jimmy, your uncle is very adept at repairs. You ought to hear the record player he sings. Come on, sir. <coughs> <laughs> She's a good kid. Been with me a good many years now. I've been talking to her so much I'd forgotten that you folks were here. Say, let's talk just a moment about radio. You know, wireless communication and radio signals were sent farther and farther in 1914. Then wireless communication was established between Germany and America. And President Wilson and the Kaiser exchanged messages. Of course, this was before the countries were fighting each other. Well, then, along in 1915, a person's voice sent over the air in Washington was heard way out in San Francisco and Hawaii. But most of these signals were heard on uh, uh, headsets by ham operators. The war brought about several notable technical advances. Then after the war, the number of ham operators doubled. Many of these men during their war service had seen what radio could do. And now out on their own, they were trying to experiment. Well, it was about this time that a man named David Sarnoff came into the picture. He came up with the idea that people could have radio music boxes right in their own home. There would be a central broadcasting station in the city which could play music. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Just about the radio setup we have today. Then in 1920, Dr. Frank Conrad started broadcasting voice and music two nights a week in Pittsburgh. When the Westinghouse Company saw the popularity of Dr. Conrad's broadcasting station, they built one in East Pittsburgh, and it was here that radio broadcasting, as we know it, got its first start. The station was assigned the call letters KDKA, and on November 2nd, 1920, it broadcast the return to the presidential election, Harding defeating Cobb. Well, radio was off to a good start, and soon it, too, would become an art medium, reflecting the times. Hey, I'd better skip up and see how Jimmy's coming with that bicycle. He'll have to spread all over the yard before I get up there. Oh, by the way, next time you drop in, we'll talk about the first part of the Roaring Twenties. We'll talk about coonskin coats and flappers. Should be fun. Bye now.